All right. Welcome to Magic Without Fears, the Hermetic Podcast. We have Dr. Megan Rose in the building. You're down in uh, California, not in San, it's San Francisco. Yes, you're in San Francisco, correct? Yeah, you can tell yeah. by the, but the pillows behind you. <laughs> and you have a new book out, Spirit Marriages. Yes, and Spirit Marriage, Intimate Relationships with Otherworldly Beings. Yeah, with otherworldly beings. And um, I was checking out um, one of your interviews today on your YouTube uh, with a witch doctor, which uh, I love that she is reclaiming the term witch doctor, um, given some people don't like her using the word sh uh, shaman or shamanism. Um, and so I thought that would lead to just actually an interesting off the cuff question to start things off. What do we, how, how, how does cultural appropriation work if you accept reincarnation? <laughs> Oh, oh, just that little tiny nugget of a oh, question. Well, this is a hard-talking occult podcast. We don't pull punches here. Everyone knows that. <laughs> have, you, have you ever just listened to the podcast? To, just to give me a softball to, to start with. Oh, my God. You should hear the first thing I said to Dr. Sam Cannon when he came on a while ago. Go check that out. I might regret having started things that way, but what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's a really good question, and it's it's not an easy pat answer, right? Like, we have memories of of many lifetimes. Those of us that are spirit workers and do this kind of work, we tend to have past life memories, and they tend to not be exclusively to our ancestral bloodline because that we, you know, we understand the soul and how the soul uh reincarnation works or transmigration of the souls or whatever you want to um however you want to grok that um so we have you know many cultures that we feel very strongly and some of them not even around anymore right like some ancient civilizations that might not be accessible and um i think that you know and uh just you mentioned Caroline, the Washington witch doctor. Um, Caroline, I think mentioned this in, when we were talking about it in her interview and, and how we don't wanna fall into the trap of nativism, right? Like where you can only practice or study or worship beings, entities, traditions that are in your ancestral line, right? That becomes a really dangerous, narrow, um, um, perspective, particularly, you know, when you're looking at certain dominant groups and cultures that have claimed that as their, you know, um, this is the way it is and, and, you know, this sort of like manifest destiny approach to spirituality. So we want to be really careful about not about not making those claims that you can only work within this narrowly defined um, uh, spirituality and at the same time like racism and um, white supremacy are real right and and there are people by POC people that have suffered for hundreds maybe thousands of years right at the at the hands of these sort of like manifest destiny um, nativist uh, practices and so for me, the conversation, and I talk about this in the book, right, the conversation is cultural appreciation, right, versus cultural assimilation, versus cultural appropriation, right? So we appreciate other cultures, and that looks like having relationships with deities and sometimes practices from other um from other cultures that are not our, our maybe ancestral or, or, the, or the traditions that we were raised in. But it's pretty clear that, that deities from other pantheons and other traditions are calling people transculturally. Like, you know, the, 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 as Caroline says, the deities aren't really concerned as much about your your ancestry as the practitioners are. The practitioners tend to be more. And then there are closed traditions where they say, it, where it's sort of like, this is our tradition and it's a closed circle. And, and unless you're specifically invited in or adopted, you know, these traditions are not open for, um, for looky-loos. 
that's fine. So we sort of work within the traditions that are open and the ones that we feel called to and we appreciate, right? Non traditions that are not native to our, you know, our, um, um, uh, part of our, you know, either our upbringing or our ancestry. Cultural assimilation, right, is when a, a group, and this, I think the great example of this is uh, New Orleans, right, where you see um, the Haitian voodoo practices, right, that came into New Orleans um, and were assimilated right, the, the, the practitioners of those traditions assimilated themselves into Catholicism, um, sometimes by hook or by crook, right, like to survive. They sort of assimilated and took on the trappings of um, that more dominant culture to, to, to survive, essentially. And so you see that, you know, this is where you see like a deity become like a saint. Yeah. Um, and there's this, this corollary between the two. Um, and that's usually a survival mechanism of a culture that is, um, that is a, a not a dominant culture and that is in the threat of being lost or er erased, right? And then cultural appropriation is this idea that I'm gonna go, I'm gonna practice somebody else's culture and um, based on my privilege, um, either through, my my skin color or my education or my financial privilege, whatever the my my ability my gender whatever i'm going to profit off of this um marginalized culture at the expense of so and that's sort of the key distinguishing i'm profiting off of this culture at the expense of other people in that culture and it's so multi-layered and and it's so nuanced there aren't a lot of you know hard and fast rules here it's a kind of um feeling your way trying to do the best that you can do if you are being called by a, a tradition that is that is not your sort of innate tradition um and and sort of finding your way with it so like in my own practice, I practice a tradition, a Shakta Tantra, right, which is a, an Indic tradition. I am not Hindu or and I am not, you know, from Indian um, ancestry. And so I have constantly, I'm sort of checking in and asking, you know, how, how do I practice this in a way that honors and respects the uh, originating culture? And, you know, one of my decisions has been not to teach or seek to teach Shakta Tantra as a, as a, as a teacher, as a practitioner. I practice it. It's part of my own personal private practice. I study it. But um, the things that I practice more publicly are fairy seership, ceremonial magic, these things that um, uh, have less of a cultural red flag for me. Um, even though the Shakta Tantric tradition um, it informs, right, like my magical body and, and how I practice privately, it's not something that I'm seeking to like publicly uh, benefit off of. And I like to direct people to, you know, if people are interested in that, it's like, great, here's some wonderful resources, here's some people, here's the community that you can support. And, you know, in the book, we talk about it, I talk about it, you know, quite a bit. And also, like some of the traditions, like the West African shrine keeper, um, who is practicing the Dagara tradition from Burkina Faso, West Africa. So that was brought by Malindoma, Dr. Malindoma Some from Burkina Faso. And he created sort of outposts in the United States to bring those teachings to the US and to non-African people and train them in African spiritual technology. But the way that they tend to work is they send a portion of, um, of the, they sort of tithe. It's kind of like this tithing back to the original community in Burkina Faso and upholding them. So the West Coast and the East Coast mm -hmm. communities are upheld by the teachings. And so they're financially upholding the community back in Africa. So that's an old, that's an old practice, isn't it? Sending money back to the community. That's mm -hmm. uh, people going abroad and doing that. It's like we see it 
pervasive today, but I think that's always been a really common practice. Um, what's an example of a closed system for those who um, might be wondering? Some of the Native American traditions are closed systems. And again, you know, it, it just, I think it's, I think that it is probably more group by group and individual um, circle or um, practitioner group than maybe a blanket tradition because you're always gonna find exceptions or people that are, you know, maybe adopted into. Um, some folks say that um, the, uh, the Kabbalistic or the Jewish tradition is a closed system. Um, <laughs> that, that's, you know, that, that's interesting. We can talk about that. We can talk about that as is, you know, ceremonial magic has a lot that, it, a lot that it, um, been, that it draws from um, and is informed by, right? The, 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 um, the Kabbalistic tradition. And, you know, I mean. I mean, if, if it was really a super closed system, then, then the amount that I know about it maybe could be argued to be more the fault of the Hasidic rabbi in Vienna in 97, who actually is a Californian, believe it or not, lives, still lives in California, but that's not where he and I knew each other. Um, the fault more falls on his feet. And then the Hebrew professor, Rahel Halabe, who taught me Hebrew in seminary, is, is it my fault that I'm into so much into Kabbalah or is it the native? And, and that's where I think, and that's where, yeah. And that's where I think it gets into sort of like, not even regionalisms, but like individual groups and whether their group is open or closed, right? I, when I yeah. studied Kabbalah, I studied with my, at the time, husband who was Jewish. And we studied from a ceremonial magician who was also had Jewish ancestry. So there, you know, and I don't have Jewish ancestry. So here, you know, I'm in these very specific situations studying something. But I mean, when I originally, um, as I understand it, and you can correct me if you know differently, um, the uh, the reason that Kabbalah was a, originally a closed system is that uh, it was only taught to men over the age of 40 who had a family and a successful business. So um, as I understand it, originally those were like the four qualifications. It wasn't taught to women. It wasn't taught to people under the age of 40. It wasn't taught to people who were struggling financially. So there's all these sort of like interesting barriers to be able to, to, to receive Kabbalistic teaching. Um, and another one of my um, early Kabbalah teachers, um, he was not um, Jewish, but he went to a Jewish rabbi. Um, and and petitioned the Jewish rabbi to learn Kabbalah and was denied two times. And the third time, you know, like that's the sort of tradition is you have to yeah. ask three times. So the third time he was admitted to study. So, um, yeah, so he, there are, I think whenever people say, well, this is a close tradition, then there are often exceptions. And, and that was one of the things that I liked to explore in, in the book was, um, and, and Caroline's story in particular, um, at one point when I was talking to people about spirit marriage, um, I was told, well, once the spirit marriage happens, there's never a divorce. There, there, divorce is not an option, right? But then I went and talked to Caroline and Caroline told me, oh no, I've divorced a spirit. So I always, you know, and as a researcher, you love that. You love when somebody says, well, this is how it is. And then you trot over and talk to somebody else and they're like, oh no, you know, this is different. This is different. This, this is different because it gives you a really wide perspective on how, a lot of these rules uh, that seem hard and fast in one group are more mutable or interpreted differently in another. It's one of, for me, one of the most interesting areas of study. Um, and I don't know if that's because I'm, sometimes I feel a bit more of an academic even than an occultist, um, uh, but that's just because of my curiosity level, really, I think. And, and you look at the, the, the switch, the, the shift 
between from Jewish Kabbalah into Christian Kabbalah is just a fascinating transitional period. I mean, it, and it didn't happen in isolation from the Jewish Kabbalists themselves. And that's, that's something we only are really getting a full picture of recently. It was only just a few years ago that Moshe Adel put out a paper showing that Raymond Lull, who of course, the blessed Raymond Lull famously wrote about these spheres and these all these things. And it's like, this looks really Kabbalistic, but there was zero evidence for any Kabbalistic influence. And then Moshe Adel found out he had been being taught by a famous rabbi in, in, in Italy who was writing to him and teaching him this stuff. And it's like, boom, there we go. Okay, so what is Christian Kabbalah then? Like, first of all, we reverse the tree. Like we, we step back into the tree rather than see ourselves reflected in it. So that switches all the sephira. And then, uh, for example, uh, we've changed the path allocations and even the shape of the tree. But there's individual Kabbalistic schools. I mean, uh, the Zohar was written largely in response as a reaction to the rationalism and Aristotelianism of, of Maimonides and his whole guide to the complex and that whole movement. And so there was a pushback and that led to the writing down of the Zohar by all these Kabbalists who were like, okay, we're going to have to show what we actually know here and, and put it out there. But even today, of course, Kabbalah, Kabbalah is still so it's it's still a very closed system because without knowing Hebrew, you're you're really limited in what information you can access. Literally, none of like Abraham Abulafia has been un, is untranslated. One of the most significant, like you know, it, it, can you imagine studying Christian mysticism but not being able to read Meister Eckhart? It would be like you're missing a huge chunk. You're just like so. The cultural appropriation thing is just fascinating me and i'm glad we got to do a little bit on it there because like we're not going to resolve anything here um except to say it's like it may be cool to do tarot readings might be another thing to dress up like romany and go sell flowers on the street and offer tarot readings that might be right. a, a step too far okay right right yeah, yeah. and yeah. i had such wonderful experiences with the first nations community here in british columbia growing up so many seven day hikes with sweat lodges and all this stuff like they want you to experience their culture. They also want you to pay to experience their culture. And they have no qualms telling you that, especially when you're hanging out with them afterwards. They're just like, oh, we only do this. Some, they'll tell you, someone will tell you, we only do this to get money from Whitey, you know? And it's like, really? And they'll be like, yep. <laughs> Some I've had elders look at me and say, yep. And I'm like, well, I love your culture and I love participating on this. Like, and we want you to love it. And we want you to keep coming back. And it's a good thing for you. It'll heal your soul, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. They make well, and, and I went to um, when I was doing my PhD, there was a, a, one of my colleagues in the program who was from Africa, practiced Kemetic Kabbalah. Um, yes. So out of out of Egypt. And so, you know, that gets into the really interesting question, which is way off topic topic, but like that sort of um, that seedbed, right, of of the blending of both the the Egyptian and the the Greco Egyptian and the Hebraic culture, right, that is happening in Egypt and the cross pollination and the cross influences that were kind of going on there. Um, and I I have not done the research on the Kemetic uh, Kabbalah enough to um, to know sort of when and where it originated. But um, you know, yeah, we're familiar with Christian Kabbalah and Hermetic Kabbalah and Jewish Kabbalah and Coptic and Egyptian or Kemetic and um, and where one starts and where one begins is an interesting inquiry that is. <laughs> Uh, the Assyrian tree of life is re is older than all of them, and it actually has it's the their the god names in their location like they correspond to the Hebrew names like the god Yah E A is the divine name Yah Yud, you know, yeah. uh, Yud Aleph, and uh, uh, same with L, right? Like these they're, they're the same thing. So the tree of life goes predates Hebrew culture for sure. Um, and the fact that it exists in other cultures in remarkably similar forms is, of course, delightful. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what? Tell us. What, did this book come directly out of your uh, your dissertation? Yeah, it did. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. What was it like getting to do a dissertation and looking at spirit marriages in yeah. some form? How was that? 
that was it was well it was a labor of love as many dissertations are um it it really started you know 20 some odd years ago when I was I like to say I was pagan light at the time you know I'd gone to some spiral dances with Starhawk and hung out you know at a few pagan events here and there but I wasn't you know I had been out of seminary for a number of years where I had sort of originally started studying paganism wasn't really I went to the graduate theological union in Berkeley yeah yeah okay so I did my master's there in the late 90s um, in religion and society. Um, so sort of studying religion and ethics. And, um, and then in the early 2000s, I was having really interesting um, sort of paranormal encounters with these spirit beings. I mean, it. I, I won't go into the whole story, but I had had a really powerful Kundalini awakening experience. And that sort of lit me up like a Christmas tree on the astral. And I was like, all of a sudden, like open for business with the spirit realm. And, <laughs> awesome. um, that's what led me to ceremonial magic, because I needed to learn really quickly how to like <laughs> grid and banish and protect and discern, right? So, um, along you know along that trajectory i started having a, a spirit lover that would appear um mostly in my dreams i've always been a really powerful dreamer and had you know sort of precognitive dreams and um and whatnot and so i've always paid attention to my dreams and i began to have this repeated spirit lover in my dreams which i thought was interesting i mean you know okay um and then um, after, I want to say a, a couple of years of that, the spirit started proposing to me, like, and literally, like, I want to marry you. And I was like, what? Like, I had no clue that that was even a thing. I mean, I knew from my seminary studies um, about, you know, the sons of God and daughters of men. And I knew that, you know, in many cosmological traditions, there is this idea of humans and otherworldly beings mating. And, you know, I knew this was sort of a, um, an anthropological and, and maybe a, you know, a, a spiritual tradition. And I mean, obviously like the Virgin Mary, right. Getting impregnated by, um, God, the Holy Spirit, Gabriel, depending on, you know, how you interpret that story. Um, but I didn't know that it was still happening. I mean, that was news to yeah. me. That's and, we're talking about Genesis 6, 1 to 4 here. That's what you're talking about. It's, it, I'm so glad you brought that up because, so that's what I, in seminary, that's why I wrote my major exegesis on. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'll send you a copy of it. Oh, I would love and, to read that. Because I think yeah. I took it on academia.edu or whatever. Well, uh, yeah. uh, uh I, 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 I was going to do it as my master's thesis, but then I found out someone was doing it as their doctoral dissertation and they, they, they would publish it the same year I graduated from my master's. I was like, okay, obviously I'm not going to go full tilt against someone who's already got like, you know, got the languages better, you know, and, and finally that book's become affordable, quote unquote affordable. So now yeah. I'm studying their work to update my own work because mine was the oh. most advanced work at the time. But then right. that came out, and now that's the most advanced work. So now I'm going to try and add a little what I've well, cool. well, add anything to it. Send me the link to their yeah. um, dissertation when when you send me that paper. I would love to read it. But, so what's but what's interesting in in regards to what you're saying about that passage is even more than the flood narrative, biblical scholars can generally these days now think that the Genesis six one to four passage and those four little little verses or pericopes um, really don't fit well with each other, especially the terminal one. And it's b believed that what we're looking at is an even older mythological insertion than the flood narrative. So that yeah. the flood narrative would have even been uh, canonical during those hill tribe oral tradition days of the Bible's formation, um, but that that the that that particular nephilim and and the sons of god copulating with the daughters of men 
was an, a mythological insertion from much older cultures and they didn't really know where to put it. And they're like, well, hey, let's use that as a justification for why people don't live so long anymore. And thus the days will be numbered to 120. And then, and they're, oh, then there was also mighty men of renown on the earth in these days and, and such things. And right. it's just, it's very haphazard in the way it's right. just chunked in there. Um, and, and, so and, my God, and very old. And why, yeah, why God needed to come in and like wipe everybody out because we created all these giants and they were wacky, you know, doing wacky stuff uh, and causing problems and wh whatnot. Yeah, so, you know, I looked at the Enochian text, right, um, that that has some uh, from the from the, you know, Nag Hammadi um, discovery and that has a little more elaboration on that that's sort of extra canonical yeah. and um, and I remember studying that it was actually in a class on heresy which was really um, one of my favorite seminary right. classes um, which I you know I love this you know as an aside the the term heretic right the original uh, translation of that is one who is able to choose so a, a heretic is someone who is choosing their belief right yeah. choosing what they are focusing or, or, or basing their, their spiritual practice on. So taking a class on heresy and we had uh, one of the, the professors and the, the professor that was teaching the class, um, they, I, I remember the joke uh, around school was like, ask professor so-and-so about sex with angels. And so that was, you know, and it always stuck in my mind uh, about this story. And then, you know, here some 10, 10 odd years later, I'm having uh, a similar kind of, you know, encounter um, where I'm, you know, trying to make sense of it. And, you know, back, that was like the early 2000s. So I, you know, I, Google wasn't even a thing. I think I like Netscape 2000 <laughs> searched the term spirit marriage, you know, because it was a spirit and it was wanting to marry me. And I think I came across like Ida Craddock and the Vodou tradition, like a, a New York Times article from the late 90s, early 2000s about um, the Vodou mariage loi. And that was it. And so I began to study it you know, and, and try and collect data on it. And a ceremonial magician friend of mine was like, you should meet Orion Foxwood. I think you'd really appreciate his approach. He's a, a folkloric fairy practitioner and is married to the fairy, to a fairy in that tradition. And, um, and he's really articulate. And I think you'd really, you know, appreciate his approach. And, um, and so I just began to research, you know, and, and kind of on my own trying to pull together the material. And then about five or six years into that, mid 2000s, um, I had a really powerful dream. And in my dream, I was in a PhD program, I had finished it and I had this, this material that I developed. And I was like, um, in this uh, very specific like oak paneled office area. Um, and I was, you know, teaching, I was preparing to teach this, this material. And I woke up from the dream and I was like, well, I guess it's time for me to go back and do my PhD. So I, uh, um, I looked for uh, programs that would allow me to study not just religion and spirituality, but like the sort of um, consciousness studies, right? Because that this information was coming to me in a non-ordinary or in a dream state, right? That was one of my primary ways of contact. So I knew that consciousness and, and, and very alter, various altered and paranormal states of consciousness needed to be sort of part of this program or part of this, um, this way in which I approached the material. And, um, and I only found a couple of schools, two of which happened to be like in my backyard here in the Bay Area, one of which was online. And, um, and so one of the schools uh, I went and, and visited and it just didn't feel right. And the, the other school, which is CIIS, California Institute of Integral Studies here in San Francisco, um, they had enrollment had ended for that 
fall, but um, I remember talking to them and they're like, well, you know, if you want to come in and do an entry interview, we'll meet with you. And, you know, if you can get your application in, if you're interested in, we'll consider you for the fall. And I went to down to the school. I'd never been in there before, went in to the, um, to meet with the department chair. And it was that oak paneled room from my dream. I mean, it was like, I was gobsmacked. So I was like, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, CIIS has a fairly um, robust app, um, uh, reputation for being sort of um, fringe adjacent, meaning, you know, we were one of the first schools to offer a, um, a certificate in psychedelic studies, and um, they have a lot of sexological and really just emergent paradigm programs, um, a department in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. I was in the East-West psychology department. So it was a really good fit, and they were very um, open to me pursuing this um, very transgressive, very fringe material, right? Spirit marriage. Um, mm -hmm. And doing it in a way that was going to be not just about my academic prowess, but about my practitioner heart as well, right? So I took a very embodied, um, a embodied academic approach to it, meaning like, yes, all the data is there, but also this was a transformative or what we call organic inquiry process where I was really, the, the data arose not only from what I collected and researched, but also from my own phenomenological transformation that happened. Yeah, it's, that's one of the most exciting things I found, uh, you know, 20 Oh God, over 20 years ago now when I started grad school and, and discovered how much work, is, how much emphasis is being started, uh, put now into exploring forms of qualitative research, right? Which is um, something that just really was uh, frowned on for hundreds of years, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, if not more even. I mean, last yeah. time it was probably a trendy thing was, was during like the, <laughs> the mystics and patristics who were like, yeah, well, Jesus told me so there. You know, yeah. that's some qualitative research there. It <laughs> is. Um, it's hard to argue it because it's yeah. qualitative research, but I guess if Jesus said so. <laughs> right. Well, and, you know, I was very, I felt very strongly uh, that this research shouldn't just be about the history of spirit marriage, right? right. But that I really wanted to understand the contemporary application and practice of it, and therefore, I needed to do it as a qualitative inquiry by, by interviewing various contemporary practitioners, right? And then um, including my own, my own journey, my own story in that, which in the, um, through the frame of organic inquiry and phenomenology and heuristics, that's you know, part of how you approach um, that 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 methodology right that that research process um, the lovely thing about organic inquiry is that it really understands that the research process can be a sacred ritualized process and it it also invokes the the daimonic intelligence of the research itself as its own entity as its own intelligence that you are in relationship with or you're in conversation with and that just got me all excited you know because that it was not just me trying to figure this out but it was really all of these um, the extraordinary being that had pulled me into the research in the first place and then all of these the others the both human and their spirit spouses that participated in the research and so you know, it was whenever I would reach a moment where it felt like ugh, I'm up against a wall, like I can't like, for example, um, I don't have initiation or very much um, training in the African diaspora traditions of Haitian and New Orleans Vodou. And so I didn't have entree into those cultures and I really wanted to include them and include their stories, but also do it in a way where I wasn't just like the researcher on the outside coming in and like, presupposing my assumptions or whatever. I, I wanted to be in, invited in, in a way that there was trust there. And so um, I, I didn't know 
you know, who to approach or, or how to attract, the, uh, you know, people from uh, those traditions that would, that would open and talk to me. And uh, so I consulted with an with a New Orleans mambo and she gave me a ritual to a road opening ritual to do and I wow. went to the spirits I went to Papa Legba and asked you know and and I also had another dream I should say that I had another dream <laughs> and in the dream there was a uh a, a gede that appeared to me in my dream and said I want you to come to New Orleans and I want you to interview me and I was like okay cool now what now how do I find you and so that's you know it, it, signs and wonders were uh, a, a major theme of how the dissertation manifest and so you know did I interview every single possible spirit marriage tradition on the planet right now no <laughs> That was that would I would never I would still be interviewing right I yeah. inter I you know I I I set out the invitation. I did my rituals. I invited the spirits that wanted to come and collaborate with me on this material. And then the people that came to me during this, you know, two year window when I was collecting the data are the people that ended up in the book. And I will be the first to admit that there's plenty of other traditions and practitioners out there. I'm still discovering traditions to this day that I didn't know about that have that include spirit marriage as part of their um, their their practice um, so it's an ongoing you know it's an ongoing inquiry what was one of your favorite traditions to uncover that might have sort of surprised you or excited you in the process mm. Mm. Do they generally fit sort of patterns uh, or, or, or how, how divergent were they? You know, it was really interesting. I, so I inter ended up interviewing nine different practitioners in seven different traditions. Um, I interviewed Orion Foxwood in the fairy seership tradition, Caroline Kenner, who you mentioned, that is, a, she's basically like a pantheist. She's a very eclectic in a few different traditions. She's married to a number of different deities cross pantheons. Um, I interviewed a West African Dagara uh, practitioner. Uh, well, they're not West African. They practice the West African Dagara tradition here in the Bay Area. Uh, I interviewed a Shakta Tantric who is married to the goddess Kali. Um, I interviewed uh, a, a New Orleans Haitian Mambo and then three um, excuse me, a New Orleans Vodou Mambo, and then three Haitian Vodou practitioners. Um, and then I interviewed a ceremonial magician about the um, knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel operation, which I was That's like, one. I was like, we're not divided on that at all. Oh, I know, right? Um, I mean, there's very strong opinions on whether that would qualify as a spirit marriage or not. And I, I you know, to be totally honest, I flip flop back and forth. That's I'm a like, really good question, actually. Could the whole Abramelin be seen as a spirit marriage? Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, I- You I, know what would be interesting is to look into Martinism. Unfortunately, I'm not a Martinist and therefore know very little about it, but I do know Oh, this may be, maybe I'm not meant to reveal this. I don't know. I'm not meant to know it. So I'm not breaking any vows, but apparently there's some part of one of the initiations that involves sort of a marriage between you and your angel. Yeah, exactly. So that might be worth looking into. So, so here's the interesting thing, because, you know, the ceremonial magician that I spoke with, um, who is a fairly level, fairly high level initiate, um, and had successfully done the Abra Melon operation. Are they from the Thelemic tradition or the GD tradition or, or nothing? Neither. They're, they're, they're GD. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Big difference between the way those two interpret that stuff. Yeah. So what he told me was that marriage isn't an inaccurate term when if we understand the sort of mechanic of the bondedness that's going on but it's sort of not um not the parlance that is preferred for understanding what's going on in the knowledge and conversation operation um and and so i you know being a transcultural you know, it, the fact that I was doing a transcultural sort of survey and looking at this from a variety of different angles, 
the thing that I found most interesting is that in um, the example with the Shakta Tantric that I interviewed, so in, in the Tantric practice, there is the Ishta Devi or Ishta Devata, right? Which is one's chosen deity akin to, you know, and I don't want to say it's an example, exactly a one-to-one -one corollary, but there is a, a very similar energy to like one's angel, right? Um, it's the deity form of oneself that you're sort of in this deep relationship with. In the case of the Shakta Tantric that I interviewed, her Ishta Devi is Kali, and she is married to Kali. So there's a really good, again, like whenever somebody says, well, we don't marry our divine self, right? We don't marry our angel. Then we trot over here and we talk to the Shakta and she's like, yes, I'm married to Kali and Kali is also my Ishta Devi, my divine self. So <clears throat> again, we're just sort of like looking at all the different hard and fast lines. And it may just come down to the internal orientation of the practitioner or the agreed the agreement set within that particular group and practice circle uh, as to what is considered, you know, the norm. But um, to say something never happens or this is just like this or, ne or, or never like this is a little you know, is a little mi misleading, and particularly when you're talking about spiritual phenomenology, right? Yeah, I, I think the the marriage and wedding uh, example is 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 really appropriate in the Golden Dawn for connecting with the the higher genius or holy you know holy guardian angel. Holy guardian angel, interestingly, was not a term used uh, I think ever in the Golden Dawn because Mathers put out the the Abermelon ritual and discovered the Abermelon ritual when he was living in Paris and was quite far away from the GD and it never entered into the curriculum. It was Crowley that brought it into the curriculum. The, when you hear uh, ceremonial magicians and even golden god magicians talking about the Abermelon and the importance of doing that and connecting with your holy guardian angel, that none of that's golden dawn. People, people actually don't realize that it's optionally. Yes. But the, what you could argue, what is done in the Abermelon grimoire is uh, an alternate route if you don't go through the Golden Dawn initiations. It's it's similar to the same thing that's happening in the solar initiation in the Golden Dawn, which is based on, of course, the Rosicrucian manifestos. The first being the Fama Fraternitatis, second being the Confessio Fraternitatis, and the third, you know what the third's called, right? I don't. The chemical wedding. Oh, the chemical, yes, of course. Yeah. So that's what's happening inside the vault of the Adepti is a chemical wedding between you and your higher and divine genius. Yeah. And that's what happens when you, you know, do all the other stuff. Um, yeah. And then the Abermelon seems to be like a version of that. Yeah. Um, and well, and a lot of us do want to do both or eventually, you know, but some people yeah. just pick one road. Um, yeah. Either way, I think the wedding, uh, the marriage thing is a, gives tremendous insight. And the fact that you were, you're looking at that in different cultures and different systems will give a lot of insight for, you know, us, you know, like in the Golden Dawn terms, in the Abermelon context, yeah, it's really valuable research that you've done. Uh, hey. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I found, um, you know, two things. One is um, Frater Lux, the ceremonial magician that I, that I interviewed, was very clear to point out that Abermelon was just one way, right? That was one formula that you can use, and even not a highly prescribed formula, right? There's yeah. a lot that you have to develop on your own as part of that three-day initiation. And the interesting corollary to that is in the Vodou traditions, right? There is the marriage loa, which is the marriage between the human and the loa, right? The deity. But then there is also the matet. And the matet ritual is much more akin to abramelin in that it is literally opening up the head and placing one's matet, one's, which is like the patron deity or the angel into and integrated into consciousness um, with the with the human with the individual and um, what's interesting about the the matet as I understand it and again I am not a, a vodou initiate is that the matet can change just like That's in the tantric tradition the ishta devi can change so, so 
so uh, Hongin, uh, my pronunciation might not be great. Um, a Hongin might go through several matats in their lifetime. Uh, or a mumbo, yeah, can go through. Uh, it can, you can have, uh, my understanding is that you can have more than one and that they can change sort of um, maybe like a rotating cast of characters or maybe like what is the, what is the primary flavor emphasis during this phase of your life and that, you know, um, the the couche ritual is a week long ritual in which the and this is what makes the ongan or the mambo is the matet. That's where the 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 deity or the the um, the patron um, saint is um, or loa is is placed, and that is um, part of the initiation ritual to become a priest or a priestess in that tradition. Whereas the mariage loa is more um, anybody within the, the Omfu, within the, the temple can have a mariage loa um, and that can be done like a wedding ceremony within a day. Um, whereas the, the couche and the, um, and the matet ritual is a much longer, similar to Abra Melon, where you're literally hermetically sealed for a, a period of time and need to be tended to by your community, right? The Unless community you're totally has... gallivanting around Europe while you do it, <laughs> or, <laughs> or in the ancient Near, or the near East. Yeah. What, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's some people do think uh, there's no alternative to the Abermelon, but I think the way to see it is that it's fair to say that a grimoire, that, that, that nothing, that, you know, grimoire does what a grimoire does and, and nothing else does exactly that. You know what I mean? So it's like nothing else will do exactly what the Abermelon will do, but I don't think it is the only way. I think, I think people, who, I, I, and I have a lot of friends who think it's the only way. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think I, you just have to do it. And, I, and we just disagree. Yeah. Well, and, and that operation for me happened <clears throat> through a thelemic, thelemic um, magical temple uh, that was akin to like a Gnostic mass that used a, um, an entheogen as a sacrament. And um, the, the, cool. the. Right up my alley. Pardon? That's right up my alley. <laughs> yeah. So the um, he, the the person that oversaw the 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 ritual that I went through is a, a high level initiate in the OTO and uses this entheogen in a hermetically sealed Gnostic temple. And um, not everybody necessarily has that knowledge and conversation as, as part of it, although it can happen. But I had been doing a lot of preparatory work up to that, not knowing that I was going into that temple to do this working. Um, but, you know, I had been doing a tremendous amount of work. And then when we went to do the sacrament and do the ritual, that's what happened for me was full knowledge and conversation with this um, in powerful, powerful indwelling and a series of different deities that revealed. And when I told the bishop about it afterwards, um, they confirmed. They're like, you know, what you just experienced was 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 this you know knowledge and conversation process and you know this is this is one of the things that working with entheogens can do right they're known to sort of sidestep some of the um the ways in which our conscious mind and for me it wasn't like whole oh, revelatory things I didn't know about myself. For me, it was actually just beautiful confirmation of so many moments throughout my life and my, my journey and my practice up until that moment. And what the medicine did was it set aside that part of me that is like, this isn't real. This is just, you're just making this up. This is all just prescribed, you know, pre, you know, pre-programmed in there. It just set that part of my brain aside and took me into just the bhava or just the complete surrender of the, the experience and allowed it to be, you know, very holy, very profound. And I write about it. I actually, um, in the, in my story, in the book, I give the transcript of that journey. I'm trying to guess from your description, which entheogen it was. <laughs> I well, I'll tell you, it was, you know, I, because I reveal it in the book, it was 5-MeO-DMT. Yeah, we, as soon as you mentioned like the, the monkey brain phenomenon, that cuts out some in my opinion. Like there's yeah. some entheogens that, that I've never experienced monkey brain on. 
but then there's some that it definitely does have. So 5-MeO, wow, that's a, that's a, that's that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if you look at the research around it, um, the way that the the way that the the priest describes it is um, you know using the Kabbalistic frame for a moment is it's literally like going from Malkuth to Kether in like yeah. like that's that's what it was like seconds or less. You know, it was it was way less shocking to me than NN. And I think the reason is because of all the ritual years of ritual work I've been doing in meditating since I was seven in, you know, transcendental meditation. So when I did 5-MEO, I shot up straight up the, like, you know, to the scintillating white light of what I could have only, I could only experience as like Oren Sof, the infinite light of beyond Keter. Beyond beyond the of yeah. existence, and I was dissolved in it. I wasn't in very long. I didn't really hit it too hard. I actually have a video of me coming out of it on my website where you can watch my first words and hear me talk yeah. right after I came out of it. Yeah. I'm like in full yeah. robes and I used all my golden dawn elemental tools to help ground my my energy in the physical world because I definitely yeah. wanted to come back. Yeah. I have a theory that you probably could not come back, though I don't know if that's actually ever been studied. If there's any recorded deaths on 5-MEO or NND. Well, Martin, Martin Ball, who is sort of the leading 5-MEO uh, published expert, Dr. Martin Ball, um, uses it for end of life, like people who are terminally ill, to help people get over the fear of going into that non-duality place. But no one's ever died using 5-MEO. And it is a component within the ayahuasca brew. So, you know, ayahuasca has other things mixed into it. but 5-MEO is one of the, is one of the components in, in ayahuasca. Um, but, but like, unlike ayahuasca, which is, can be like a day long process with the 5-MEO, you know, you're in and the journey, you're in and out of the journey within a half an hour, you know, an hour tops. Um, and, and I should say, then it's all of the integration. So it's sort of like you blast off, you're in this non-dual place. And then for me, the potency was actually coming back down, coming back down the, the, the ladder, right? Down wow. into and integrating. And that's when a lot of the, the profound um, information, embodiments, those empowerments, those different things happened coming back and reintegrating back into then, you know, mundane consciousness. Amazing. Yeah, it's exciting to, uh, I think, for me to consider the, the potentials of, of entheogens in our traditions from which they've been excised and how we might consider bringing some of them back in, in, in careful, thoughtful ways. I mean, uh, P.D. Newman's new book, Angels in Vermilion, from John D. to DMT, is really interesting because he's looking at Cagliostros and their their version of their masonry, their Freemasonry, they were using uh, uh, DMT in their Masonic rituals, and I didn't know that. Um, and so that's really interesting. And we know that D. and Kelly used something, and his thesis is that that's what it was. Of course, that's what I've been saying for a few years because I I got on that bandwagon. But but again, we will we'll probably never really know. Um, yeah. But fascinating to consider how these things can be used again. That's uh, something I definitely want to incorporate into uh, as an optional ver uh, variety of Celtic mystery ceremonies and the eight stuff. Uh, for people listening, actually, that's that's how we met, right? You were at my lecture at PantheaCon in 2020. I met you and your very lovely uh, ex-husband, who you're, of course, very good friends with. And that was really nice to meet you guys both. I'm sorry we didn't get to hang out more at the, at the conference, but a lot of people there, isn't there? Yeah, so it was very awesome to meet you, meet you at that lecture. Um, it seems like a lifetime ago. It, it kind of was, you know, I mean, yeah. two years, but, you know, so much, so much has shifted because that was February. I mean, we went into lockdown a couple of weeks after that, you know. Lockdown. And I had, I had just gotten better from COVID the day before I went to that, to, to lecture there. Yeah. But they, but the, the government was saying it wasn't COVID. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Charming. <laughs> <sighs> Otherwise, the whole thing would have been canceled, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, that was. I can that only was the, how much that COVID was the, I give COVID to. Yeah, that was the um, 
that was the final Pantheacon and the one that I actually presented my, my spirit marriage dissertation research at. Mm -hmm. so I actually presented that weekend on the dissertation. And then literally a few weeks later, um, we went into quarantine. And the day that we went into quarantine here in San Francisco, I got the book deal to turn my dissertation into this book. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what I spent my quarantine doing was turning my dissertation into a into a book that is much more um, trade and <laughs> much more friendly than you know than an academic tome. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was going to try and do that with my work, and I couldn't. I realized it was because you know philosophical theology, like you'd need to expand. It would need it would be like eight times. It would be like two 800 page books to have made it mainstream readable. It has to stay yeah. technical literature for, yeah. and I know yeah. that cuts out a lot of readers, but there's just nothing I can do about it other than, yeah, you know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes academia does that, you know, you just to get, to get to the, the, the edge of knowledge, you have to use such, you have to use the arguments and language that others have used to take us to the edge of that knowledge. And therefore you're stuck with these term terminologies that unfortunately, uh, keep most people out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that happens. But if you want to push knowledge forward, sometimes you have to, to do that, right? It's a, it's yeah. an interesting sort of conundrum, I think. And um, I, I was very uh, lucky in that my publisher, um, being the, the first book that I had written, you know, they like to keep those on the shorter side. And I was like, listen, we can't, I can't write about this and keep it under 200 pages. It's just not possible because I have to give you, and so this is how I divided the book. We have the past, it's in three parts, the past, the present, and the future. So the past is the historical analysis, anthropological, historical, religious studies, esoteric studies, and again, an overview of those. It's not um, exhausted by any means because that you know that could have been a 300 page book in and of itself but enough to give people the sense of like here's all the different cultures that this is uh, this is appeared in and all the ways that it's been practiced the present is these nine different spirit marriage practitioners that I interviewed including my own autoethnography right and then the future is okay now what now what are some practices if you're interested in this what are some practices what are precautions what are things that you need to know to apply this to your life and so you know it's almost a 500 page book um, but I think that it's you know it's thorough in that it is giving uh, the first sort of foray into open discussion of, of, of this in, um, in print. You know, there's lots of forums and groups and things online that are discussing it, but, um, you know, this is one of the first printed yeah. books. Yeah, that's very, that's very, it makes it very exciting. Uh, what are some of the things people should watch out for? I call it the three D's, right? The three D's of spirit marriage, devotion, discernment, and discipline, right? So um, devotion is like, know, like, and trust whatever entity you're getting involved with. And, and this is where I get really practical in my background as a, as a coach and a psychologist kind of comes in because spirit relationships, whether you're talking about like an advanced stage like marriage or just a familiar spirit kind of contact, you want to know who you're getting involved with just like you would a human, right? You want to have that know, like, and trust factor where you, um, where you are in a consensual relationship that um, that you have that you have agreed to, right? We bring things to the table. R.J. Stewart, who is also one of my teachers, um, oh really, likes to say yes. I've R.J. Stewart's what got me into the occult when I was 12, 13 with his oh. book Celtic Mystery, Celtic Magic. Like that was my yeah. that was the moment. Yeah. That was the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so RJ was one of Orion's teachers and I've studied with both of them. Um, Very lucky. But um, uh, uh, RJ says, we do things they can't, they talking about spirits, we do things they can't, they do things we can't. 
So we sort of meet each other, knowing what we bring to the table and therefore devoting ourselves to spirits that we have gotten to know. And that's where the second discernment, right? Learning the discernment practices, learning, like I said, how to banish unwanted spirits, learning how to um, be in a symbiotic relationship, right? Be in a co-creative relationship, meaning we're not showing up just like if you made a new friend, you wouldn't show up and be like, hi, I'm Megan. Can you pay for my rent this month? You know, you, 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 there's reciprocity there, right? Showing up, <laughs> being, um, d developing the discernment practices and tools to really know who you're getting involved with why, what, what their agenda is, what they want out of it, what you expect out of it, and then discipline. And that's really just the rigors of the magician, right? That is the practices, the tools, the rituals, the ceremonies, all of those things that you do on a daily basis. And that's the thing is like, you don't get to know somebody very well if you don't spend time with them. So you need to spend time with the spirit that either you're wooing or is wooing you getting to know them. I mean, I mentioned how this spirit showed up originally as a spirit lover, started wanting to ask me to marry it. It took me 15 years before I was willing to say yes to that proposal. Because the spirit was very fey, pun intended. It was a, it was a, a fey spirit. And so it shapeshifted a lot. And I didn't have a very strong cosmological or constructed identity for it. And I was not about to step into any sort of commitment with the spirit that I didn't know I can trust. And so it took me a number of years. And, you know, the first thing that I did was got myself mentors and people that could teach me how to work. You know, Orion was one of them. I had a, I have a really kick-ass transpersonal psychologist, psychotherapist that I work with who is trained in various forms of visionary states. Um, and a few other mentors that I got that really helped me discern and ground and get to the point where when my contact finally showed up and revealed its name, which is a very fairy thing, like Faye traditionally do not reveal their name um, quickly or very readily. And so it took me a while and I, there were all sorts of things that I did, sigil creation and things like that to create like sort of transitional names transitional identity Sounds like you're boxing it in you're like grand corner like a mm -hmm. like a animal almost mm -hmm. so. well i mean I, it wasn't a it wasn't predatory it was more like like well, no, but they are like wild animals in a way they, you know, they a little yeah. bit yeah well and it was it was it showed up as um two faces or two aspects to it um, and it had a very like a upper world aspect, but it had a very deep underworld aspect. And there was all my own assumptions about the other underworld that I really had to go through this sort of deep programming process through. So it was a journey, not just to find the identity of the Fae, but also to, to really rewire myself. And that is sort of a, a, a key part of the spirit marriage journey for for many many of my co-researchers they had to go through a kind of rewiring process to be able to to more fully um step into the bond um and you know and i i, I reveal in the book that the the an identity and the sort of primary identity or lens through which i work with this being is um is through the horned god Gwen Neath. So the, the Welsh Lord of the Dead, Lord of the Underworld. So there was a lot of work that I needed to do on myself to be able to get into the, the headspace of being, um, of feeling like I'm stepping into that relationship with integrity. Um, and, you know, I, I say that Gwen Neath is how an, an aspect of him. I realize that there are practitioners out there that have long and, and Welsh practitioners that have long standing tradition with Gwen Neath as one of their deities in their tradition and stuff. I don't want to say that that's 100% who my Gwen is, right? Um, because I'm not initiated into those traditions. What I will say is through the course of these 15 some odd years, that was the identity that 
that this being and I agreed on that was close enough, you know, because we went through like, are you a crossroads being? Are you Luciferian being? Are you? And I was always like, I'm like that. I'm, I'm like that. But there was this almost um, this refusal to be pigeonholed that was definitely a, a, a typifying characteristic of this contact. Bloody fairies, hey? <laughs> uh, it makes me think of we should, I should definitely, uh, you, you have a lot of background in fae or significant? Well, I mean, my, my training, one of my primary lineages is fairy seership, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, you're making me think uh, we should do a fairy round table in the future and get like some of the other folks uh, and do that. I've, I've got a Masonic round table coming up because those are fun to do. They take, I don't do them much because like round tables, they take so long to arrange with everyone. It's, it's like pulling teeth. It's so silly. So crazy. If anyone out there has secrets on how to do it, I don't think there is a way to coordinate six people's schedule smoothly. There just isn't, is there? Um, but yeah. if anyone has any tips, let me know. Because I'd love to do more round tables. So fairy round table, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. Maybe we can get a storm or Orion or who knows. We'll see. We'll just see who the universe pulls to us. I'll, I'll get the fairies to help me draw some people. And that's the way to do it, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Here's something I was really excited to talk to you about. Um, and I would, if, if you don't mind, uh, toward the end, maybe if we could talk about uh, spirit sex, which is something I've noticed a lot of people asking about. I just saw Aeon Byte uh, had a lot of questions about that on their last Enochian uh, video live stream. You know, Aeon Byte, uh, Miguel, Miguel. Um, and they a lot of people were asking about that. I was like, okay, this is something people are really curious about. Uh, my experience with that started with Gavin and Frost, Yvonne Frost's uh, book, Astral Travel, back in like the mid 90s. When you know, then they have a whole chapter that says Bishop Smith says, yes, there is sex on the astral plane. I was like, let's go, baby. Let's learn how to astral travel. And uh, you know, I've, I've been having fun with that ever since. Um, but that's my experience. And uh, I think, yeah, it would be great to talk a little bit about that. But before that, I'd love to know about your experience on the Gaia Network, because you were on that, correct? Mm -hmm. On the Gaia Channel? A lot of people, like, I can't believe how much hate people send my way, because I sometimes watch it, and, and I'll post comments from a video. I'll, like, watch something on like Crop Circles and comment on that, and they'll be like, you're a, you're a moron forever watching Gaia. That's all crap. It's like, here's my thoughts. It's literally the only network or channel out there for any of the kinds of stuff that all of us do. So it's like, it's the only game in town. And obviously in, that, in the case of any massive platform, you're gonna have stuff that you think is nonsense. And then, you, but you're gonna have stuff that is there because there's nowhere else for it to be. So all you haters hating the Gaia channel, suck it. <laughs> <laughs> How was it for you as an experience? It must've been very exciting. It was lovely, yes. So I went on um, Regina Meredith's show, Open Minds. And, you know, um, they're lovely people. I mean, you know, to hate on an entire network is a little like, that's, you know, my kind of scratch my chin. It's like, uh, are you going to hate on NBC because they have a show that you don't like? You know, I mean, it's like. Yeah, who, who would hate, who would, who would hate Fox just because it's Fox? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. but the, the, you see the point can go yeah, yeah. Way, no, right? no, it's like, um, <laughs> I mean I think that um, I'm Canadian some... so I have no shame in in throwing this stuff in y'all's face like, <laughs> I mean, it's like not my mess we got our own mess trust me I'm still not allowed to leave the country or get on a train I know right you're yeah. Canadian <laughs> I, yeah I know hey it's the Canadian stare um, our dictator's good looking and has six-pack abs that's what really matters in a dictator <laughs> Ask Putin. So, you know, Gaia, Gaia Network has some great content. They have some stuff that I don't personally watch. And, and I, get, I don't, you know, you don't need to. It's like, what, what do you find that's useful? I mean, even Regina has interviewed folks that I'm like, okay. But, you know, that's, that's fine. I, I think that um, this sort of mental policing right of what we're what we're able to access and watch is a little is, is troubling um and 
but I think really what it comes down to is critical thinking. You know, um, if we're Amen. properly taught critical thinking skills, then you can watch anything and bring your critical thinking skills to bear on it and, um, and come to, you know, come to your own conclusions. That's an answer. That's the kind of quality answer I'd expect from someone with a PhD. Thank you. <laughs> No, that, that was a really, really good answer. That's the kind of, it's the kind of thing uh, you might miss, honestly, uh, without the certain guidance in your life or education. You might miss those sort of basic things. Like the last guy I podcasted with, um, his advice at the end, well, I'm spoiling it, but actually I was going to snip it for the Patreons only, but then I fucked up and it's on the main video. So that's life. Um, <laughs> and he, I was like, what was your, what would be your tips for uh, tarot readers? And he was like, take critical thinking classes. I was like, he was a, he's a really young guy. And so I was very surprised to hear that answer. And I was like, whoa, this is impressive. And he's like, yeah, I know you'd think it would be uh, me telling you to read a book on tarot, but it, essentially I'm telling you to go back to college. I was like, yeah, this is definitely not what some of my listeners want to hear, but there you have it. Um, yeah. Critical thinking is a very powerful skill indeed. I mean, it's more important to learn how to learn than to learn. Yeah, sense. because then you can approach anything with that frame and be able to really assess it for yourself and understanding, you know, and the first thing that you understand in higher learning is that um, it's all, I mean, with very few exceptions, perhaps in the hard sciences. And I say perhaps because that even that gets a little wibbly wobbly. Yeah, perhaps it's yeah, exactly. It's all <laughs> the observer. It's all the observer effect, right? It's all about the the uh, the programming, the conditioning, the questions, the agenda that the um, that the individual shows up with. And so, you know, that's the first thing that you do when you work on a. PhD dissertation is you name your 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 parameters your lenses like I am female I'm white I grew up you know lower middle class uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area like these are all the things that that are my filters right and that are my known filters right and then we have unknown filters that we do our best to to acknowledge or to work on like recognizing, um, but they are part of our, our prejudices, if you will, or part of our privilege, right? Um, I love Lindy West talks about it as wearing blinders. It's like, you know, privilege is like blinder or these, these the way that we look at the world, we look at through a certain lens through with and with certain things hidden from our view because we simply haven't had the experience or the exposure and the work really of the researcher and and of the critical thinker is to dismantle as much of those blinders as possible so you can see as clearly as possible from a variety of different perspectives never forgetting the fact that you're always interpreting that through your own through your own experience. Yeah. Huh. I don't know if we can get more into that. Um, I uh, Before we leave Gaia behind entirely, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, we could jump into the hermeneutic circle of it all, um, <laughs> if, if you want. Uh, interpretation theory is definitely where I come alive, you know, Paul Ricoeur and Gadamer and all that. Yeah, you can probably tell from some titles behind me. Though I don't think you can read that, actually. I think I have to get a better camera setup. I'm working on it. I've got like things in development here. I didn't plug this in, for example, because some there was right before we, you, we got on board the interview, there was construction work started outside. I was like, oh, this would pick up way too much of it. And then right as we got going, they stopped. So there you go. So um, it's for show. <laughs> yeah, just for show. <laughs> it's just to, to lick when I get bored. Um, you know, yeah, I'll plug it in for the next one. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna be starting to do is live stream the interviews on YouTube as right. they're happening live. Now that I'll, 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 I'll be able to do that soon. So that'll be exciting. Cause I've always wanted this to be a live show. I, you know, I like watching live stuff. It just feels different for some reason. Who knows why it doesn't really matter. It's just fun. Um, the guy, the pro for a lot of people I'm sure out there are very curious about what it, how to get on Gaia, what it would be like to go there. You want to maybe just give people a little bit of a glimpse into the life of getting into it, going there, being on it, and just some of the little 
details that people might not think about that because there's so many practitioners out there I know who are learning their butts off and gearing up to be able to do something like that. I think they would really love to hear about just a few more details about the experience. Yeah, well, I mean, I wish I could give more insight into how to get onto it. Um, for me, it helps to have a PhD and a publisher for sure. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that's that's kind of that's kind of the bottom line is um I my publisher has an established relationship with Gaia and with this show in particular. And so they um they put the press release out about my book coming out and sent it to um the producer there and they were like, Oh yes, we'd love to have and you know it helps to have <clears throat> it helps to you know, because it's a television show to have some live video of you talking. So I had done a series of talks leading up until up to that point um, where I had done YouTube, um, various live classes and things that I had taught and had those on my YouTube channel. And so, you know, in addition to the fact that I had a book coming out, they went and sort of watched me and, and looked at me, you know, and how I present on camera and the fact that, you know, I'm, um, somewhat articulate and can and can you know hold the conversation and so um so that helped but it really was set up by my publisher and then you know the guy experience is quite lovely they you know fly you out to their um their location which is um just outside of boulder colorado and put you Beautiful. up in a hotel and um, they kind of roll out the red carpet. It was it was a really pleasant experience. The only the only drawback was that for me, um, well, number one, I went there in the middle of January, so it was freezing cold and snowing. And you know, I'm a California girl, so it was like, you know, shock to my system. And literally, Eliguen, like four days before I was supposed to fly out, I fell really severely and like almost broke my arm so my arm was severely severely sprained I mean and the sprain took like six months to it's still healing um yeah I've got an ankle that's like a year into still healing from a really bad spray it feels like there's like a hairline fracture some days I just can't even walk on it it's yeah fucking, yeah exactly uh, so literally three days before I was supposed to fly out and that was the moment where I was like I probably am going to regret this, but I'm just going to be totally unstoppable and get my butt on the plane how, by hook or by crook, you know, with one arm going through security, with carrying my suitcase. And I, you know, I couldn't even brush my hair. <laughs> I'm right handed and it was my right arm. I couldn't even properly brush my hair, put on makeup, all that fun stuff. So that was that was a moment of sheer force of will and determination to get myself there. And I was like, if I can just get in the chair, in the interview chair, I can sit there and like, you know, ignore my arm and talk to Regina and it'll be grand. And, you know, that's what ended up happening. And, and it was a lovely experience. Um, and we had a really good conversation. I think that the interview will be coming out in June is what they told me. So it should be coming out fairly shortly here. Oh yeah, I'll pay attention to when it's out, and I'll get a, I'll do Gaia for a month to to watch that. I always like check, I I check in on it, guy, every few years. Usually, I'll do a couple months and catch up on all the crop circle stuff that I love and whatever yeah. else is interesting. The psychedelia series is awesome. A lot of my friends. Very good, yeah. Yeah, like and some it's, of their, it's some of their like beyond belief and and um, quantum physics and some of the consciousness programming that they have is 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 pretty up to par. Yeah, I have some some sort of issues with George Nuri as an interviewer, but I won't speak too much on that because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but like he interviewed Jason Louv and about Aleister Crowley. And no matter what Jason said, he kept trying to bring it back to so when he so he was really involved in black magic and, and using it to like do oh, nefarious Lord. things. And it's yeah. like every time Jason said something, that's what George kept it's like. He's like he just told you Crowley was not really a black magician in the way that you think he was at all, and so yeah. why are you keep bringing it back to black magic? Because that you're just being sensationalistic, and that's that's where I can see people getting frustrated. Like yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. But that's anyway, like with, I won't. That's like with too much spirit about marriage, that. with these spirit marriage interviews, the people that just want to. I know you said you want to talk about this, which I'm totally cool. But it's like I've done interviews where all they want to talk about is sex, right? They just want to talk about the spirit sex, and I'm like. It's oh, so, uh, there's I so much more stuff. going on. 
I'm happy to avoid that. I know my audience would probably like it and other people out there would like it, but who cares? I'm, 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 I usually, people who listen to my podcast a lot know I tend to avoid that stuff a little bit just because, not because I'm a prude, just, I don't know, maybe I'm more of a reserved Canadian when it comes to that sort of thing. Who knows? Um, I'm probably more a Victorian than a Canadian, but uh, what, okay, so if some, if sex, if spirit sex is not the most interesting thing about spirit marriage, what are, would you say, some of the top two or three things that are interesting about spirit marriage? I think for me personally, and you know, uh, there are many different spiritual, spirit marriage practitioners who enter into those relationships for a variety of different reasons. One of the things that seemed to arise out of both my research and the interviews that I did is this idea of co-creation right? This idea that having a bonded relationship to a familiar spirit gives us access to knowledge and, um, and um, extrasensory perception, consciousness, whatever, that we wouldn't normally necessarily have access to as readily available, right? than, um, than, you know, just, uh, your average, your average bear. So, um, I found this idea of conscious evolution and co-creation, a really powerful, compelling reason for these practices. Um, and you see it, you know, you see it in a lot of the, um, anthropological and religious literature, right? Where, um, one of my favorite examples is the first Sabine king of Rome, Numa Pompilius, um, was married to a nymph, Egeria. Uh, he had a spirit wife, and she was his go-between between the deities and, and negotiated things with the deities, but she also helped dictate the first Roman laws. And so she had this very... Um, um, practical engagement in not only his sort of spirit life, but also in like how he ruled and how he served his people and gave him insight and gave him access to information that he wouldn't otherwise have been able to, to, to gain. And, you know, in, in the, the tantric tradition, um, for example, I talk about like marriage to the yogini often bestowed the siddhi, right? The, the ex expanded powers of, to the yogi or to the practitioner through these kinds of bonded re um, intimate relationships. And um, Caroline talks about how that they kind of activate and quicken the human consciousness and that, you know, the byproduct of the marriages, which are sometimes offspring and sometimes, you know, in my case, it was this whole book and, and teaching uh, material is, um, is this uh, kind of like co-created hybrid consciousness that, um, that is, that is an, an intelligence, a, a daimonic kind of um, entity or can be. And that really, I think, moves us all forward as a species and um, really helps us, you know, one of my theories, which I think, you know, a lot of the cosmological origin stories kind of supports is that humans have been doing these marriages since time immemorial and that they may be one of the primary spiritual technologies for evolution of the species, right? For how we sort of, um, for how our brain and our nervous systems and our energy bodies mature, expand, grow and reach beyond just our sort of finite five senses into these sort of expanded or paranormal states. So I think there's a really compelling argument for spirit marriage as a, as a, as a tool for that kind of, um, development. That's really interesting. And, um, I had a, a side thought. Did you look at the, at all in your uh, dissertation, the fact that nuns marry Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. I referenced yeah. that yeah. and, um, the begin movement, right. The begin mm -hmm. movement were all about getting jiggy with, um, both Jesus and lady love. So they had a very, 
the the beguines were fascinating. I, I wrote in my my master's um, in seminary. I wrote a, a a paper on the beguine. It was like uh, the beguine um, gods lover or lovers of God or gods lovers, and it was all about you know the erotic aspects of the beguine. It's interesting, even regular nuns were encouraged to have erotic fantasies with Jesus. And we know that because there's a plethora of diaries from, you know, around the Middle Ages before and after of these yeah. erotic accounts of nuns getting jiggy with their, their, their hubby. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great area for people if, yeah. if looking for something fun to research. It's not really been fully explored yet. But no, I, not, well, there was, a book, uh, there was a, a book written by Stanford professor, I think it was about Benedetta Carlini, um, which came, which she was an Italian abbess in, oof, I think it was the 13th or 14th century. Um, and she was uh, elevated with the, within the Theatine convent um, because that she said Jesus wanted to marry her and she went through a whole marriage ritual. And then she had a, um, a lesbian relationship with another nun that normally she would have been um, sometimes uh, in the monastery <laughs> yeah normally she would have been executed for but she said that it was an angel who was overshadowing her having sex with the nun and oh wow for Therefore, she was just sort of given a slap on the wrist. And what's interesting is that was actually turned into a movie to, that just came out last year called Benedetta by Paul Verhoeven, who, of all things, did wow. Robocop. Um, and, and and other, let's not forget the masterpiece that is striptease. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Verhoeven's so that, a, an odd duck, but yeah. hit or miss. Sometimes he hits. I'll have to watch that. Benedetta, eh? that look, that's very interesting. Yeah, I was very fascinated by those sort of areas of research uh yeah very interesting yeah stuff. And, in, and in benedetta's case you know she was sort of um she was uh, eventually stripped of her you know position but like you look at saint Teresa of avila right and the ecstasy of saint Teresa, and like that entire transcript from her um from her you know spiritual biography autobiography is all about this erotic relationship with an angel right I'll have to read that. I'm a big fan of Avila, but I've only actually read Interior Castles. I read it a lot. I used to like lecture in the Golden Dawn on that book, actually, because I found yeah. so much value in in, in it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I pulled, pulled out pieces um, yeah. from Christianity, but I really focused the research on more marginalized spiritualities Good. Um, because that I feel like that's where the light needs to really be shined really with the idea of inclusivity and inviting everybody to the table to have a conversation about this. Yeah, and certainly other traditions are a lot more open and actively engaged in practicing spirit marriage than Christians these days, I'd assume. And I'm not necessarily even sure we want Christians practicing spirit marriage at this stage. Who knows? They got enough going on. Sort out all this other nonsense. Sort of, <laughs> sort of the whole pedophile thing first, maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, you know, get your, get your house in order and then, then we'll talk about getting jiggy with spirits um, <laughs> what are some of the other uh nuanced uh, areas that that people uh, might not be uh, aware of well you know one of the things that i find really um compelling uh, about a lot of the the stories that i collected the co-researcher stories was that there was a it was a participatory spirituality meaning that community was really, if not absolutely required, like, you know, things like the mariage la loi um, re require a community, right? You're having a ritual with your community around you. The, the marriage in, or the merging is what it's called in the West African tradition, required an entire community there to witness the vows and to uphold and to celebrate. So um, in many cases, being in a relationship and this kind of spirit marriage is a community effort. Like you yourself might be stepping into the marriage, but it's witnessed, it's upheld, and it's often for the blessing and the benefit of the community oh, wow. and the people around you. It, it is, it is um, I think, ideally practiced not in a vacuum, but in relationality, relationship with, you know, the, the various people around you that are, that are impacted by 
you know, impacted by the marriage. And certainly everyone that I interviewed, um, at least they were ministers within their respective traditions. You know, they, the marriage in some ways put them in a kind of ministerial position where they're not necessarily mediating that energy for the group, but in a kind of um, that level of deep devotion that goes into the, the indwelling or the bond or the, the merge really shifts and changes the practitioner, shifts and changes their priorities, shifts and changes often their, their, their job, their life, the way that they're, you know, currently constellating their life. And a lot of them ended up, you know, asking how, how can this serve? How do I serve? What are what is the 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 fruit of this relationship and the purpose? So it wasn't generally just for personal edification. It was for the 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 ministry, right? The ministry to the yeah. community. Yeah, it's interesting that parallels. I don't want to just one quick sec to jump back to the Christian thing. It, it's interesting that that actually how the way plays out in a community parallels the change in Christianity going from a communal religion to one that emphasizes the personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is an idea you can't find anywhere in early Christianity. It's a non-existent idea. In fact, you could say it's, it's a, it, was a, it would be heretical to them because the entire point of early Christianity, the first 300 years at least, uh, was about the community's relationship with Christ, not the person's. And the, to start, speak of your own relation, my personal relation with Jesus Christ would have been abhorrent to the origin of the whole early Christians. It's essentially the entire idea of a personal relation with Jesus Christ is the creation of a new religion almost entirely, which is crazy if you actually think about that for a few minutes. You're like, wait, are you saying that Christians today aren't actually even the same as Christians back then? Sort of, in a way. And to, so to see the communal element in that dissolve over time as well as anything like the uh, the esoteric elements of the tradition as well went along with that and i just thought that's an interesting sort of parallel does that communal element does that dissolve as things are sort of uh becoming more protestantized and moving in here uh to the sort of more individualistic rugged individualism of like the the um, North American practices. I'm thinking specifically of like the Azusa Street Revival and all of the sort of um, revivalism of the Dust Bowl era, or is that predated? Predated, I think it really does come straight out of the uh, Luther's uh, Reformation and translation because he, he was tired of the church being a, a corrupt intermediary. I mean, he was, he had problems with the the use of the the the, the commodification of relics and yeah the, and that whole culture of like yeah. yeah you can touch my talisman for and buy your aunt a few years off oh, yeah. for your yeah. life savings and people would do pill like there was a it had become a, a really grotesque industry yeah. and that's what and he was like no you read the bible yourself you talk to god yourself that's where yeah. we should go so contrary to what a lot of occultists say actually you'll see primarily today you'll say that Christianity took its biggest hit with Martin Luther and the Reformation, and they stripped all the mysticism and magic out of it. It's not true. It's not true at all. In fact, when I did Luther, doing when I did Luther in seminary, I was a I was a Roman Catholic, so I was all prepared to dislike him. But I was shocked. I was like, I'm agreeing with a lot of this stuff. Like, yeah, the 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 problems he was taking issue with are things that I would find repugnant today as well, and most of us would. So he really brought a lot of mysticism back to the church. Um, that had been stripped away by the dogma and the authoritarianism. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the reason I bring up the Azusa Street Revival is because I was raised Pentecostal. And so I like to say that the Pentecostals are sort of like the... Um, the, the spirit workers in a lot of ways of, of Christianity right now, because that there's such an emphasis on the gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues, laying on of hands, ch you know, channeling the Holy Spirit and growing up in that um, environment as a child, I just was sort of like steeped in all of these, this sort of like paranormal esoteric ways in which I understood my spirituality. And it was, you know, only 
when I became a teenager and then went on into seminary that, you know, and became really disenchanted with the more legalistic aspects of Pentecostalism that I began to look at a, from a what much wider, you know, transcultural uh, approach to um, ecstatic spirituality or paranormal spirituality. Um, and that's, you know, what opened the doors and led me into my, you know, my current inquiry. But um, but there is a hugely, you know, mystical um, and and um, embodied spiritual spirituality in in Pentecostalism. Yeah, I, it's done. It, they, it's crazy. It's I mean, uh, there's a reason I I would often go to the charismatic worships, you know, because I dug it. It was a lot more similar to what I was used to uh, in, in the magical world. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, even then, than the mass, like, you know, I could go to a Tridentine mass, but sometimes it was fun going to the, the Catholic charismatic kids worship afterwards. And they're like jumping up and down and trying to invoke the Holy Spirit. That's what they're doing. It's like, yeah. why? For the, to bring grace into our lives and for the glory of God. It's like, that's like, damn theurgical <laughs> yeah. oh, oh absolutely well i and i write about this in the book that you know for me growing up um pentecostal with that practice pretty much out of the womb i was you know i and i won't go into the details but i was baptized in they're the whole exciting Spirit. huh i'm sure they're exciting details <laughs> i write about it in the book but um Good. i was baptized in the holy spirit um at, like at like nine or ten months old my body was like the the whole this whole like holy spirit fire was sort of placed inside me um and yeah. uh, so i grew up kind of with my hair on fire with that that shakti right later on i would understand it as shakti or the the kundalini kind of uh ecstasis experience <clears throat> from a very early age and um and it was highly erotic, right? So I'm, you know, here I am, this good little Christian girl on her, you know, in church service with my arms in the air and I'm just rocking and rolling because I'm having these kriyas, right? Of like ecstasis running through my body known as the Holy Spirit. But I really um, early on learned that I could have that same ecstatic embodied um, experience out in nature. So I would be, you know, getting my, you know, rocks off on a Sunday and Wednesday night and sometimes on Fridays as well, you know, going to church for three, four times a week. Um, but then I would go out and there were these ancient oaks near where I grew up and I would like, you know, be having these powerful experiences with the trees and out in nature as well. Um, so that kind of clued me in that it maybe wasn't just about the box of Christianity that, you know, that it was this much more innate endogenously or, or extrasensory um, arising of this numinous experience that I could plug into in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good one. I remember, I think it was 94 when I had, my equivalent experience and it felt like there was a fire above my head and what's interesting about that is because i was raised in the in a you know the, the tm cult with of maharishi with my family i knew next to nothing about christianity i had no idea i'd never heard of pentecost or any of those stories of the i didn't know anything about the that feeling of the fire above your head and in breathing your body and all that stuff it was uh you know <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, what got me so interested in um, comparative, uh, comparative spiritual phenomenologies is that there are these images and these somatic experiences, right, that happen in the body, irrespective, uh, often, and can be irrespective of tradition. So when I was in my 30s, I had, you know, not identified as Christian for a number for you know 15 some odd years and um I had started practicing yoga and I remember I was laying in shavasana I was laying in corpse pose and all of a sudden I started feeling this energy arise in my body that felt like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which I hadn't felt for years because I hadn't been to a Pentecostal service since I was a teenager. And I was like, what the heck is going on? This is like, 
this feels like the Holy Spirit, but this is nothing to do with Christianity. And I became obsessed, you know, um, with trying to understand what was this energy and what was going on in my energy body that allowed me to have this powerful experience. And that sort of like led me down the garden path of studying esotericism and um, energy medicine and, you know, Chinat Song and Shiatsu and all of these interesting, you know, Eastern and Western, you know, um, modalities to really, uh, I became a craniosacral therapist. I mean, it just, you know, oh, wonderful. Kind of exploded into all of these different hands-on somatic um, modalities that I trained in to really try and understand what was this, what was this innate energy that seemed irrespective of religion, but so much like, so much like that early childhood experience. <sighs> Yeah, spoiler alert, God might not be denominational. You think? <laughs> I mean, I well, it's a yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of Christianity, right? It was the transgression transgressiveness of the Holy Spirit in the first place that led to Christianity. Um so spirit's a wild, a wild thing. It's what it's what really led me ultimately to a, a sort of ecstatic naturalist view of the world rather than the traditional theistic panentheistic or pantheist ones um yeah. of course that led me into very deep ecological semiotic studies that i still have not emerged from same so mm -hmm. so i sort of lost my mind going into that field of thought thinking of nature and the universe in that way and i'm sure one day i'll come back to regular consciousness but i, I still want to understand it and i don't you know here's an interesting yeah. point that i might be able to example i might be able to give you so this is one of the conundrums that I'm working out in, in evocation of spirits or in spirit communication. It's very common to get information that you could not have known that's true. That happens. Maybe it's not very common, but it happens a lot. I was just talking to a student today, who gave me an example of it happening the other day, right? And it was very, very clearly, that's, that is what happened. And, uh, but in the clinical uh, research of, of uh, DMT and DMT entities, they haven't yet been able to find an example, apparently, from what I've heard, of a DMT entity telling a, a subject, a tripper, of anything they didn't already know, mm. that they couldn't have, that they, it wasn't already in their mind or just sort of in their subconscious, right? Mm. Which, you know, and there's lots of things that aren't in your mind and your subconscious, like where someone you don't know might be right now, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's a fact. You could find out from a spirit but something those sort of facts haven't yet been uncovered or documented on the in the dmt tutors which is the only reason why i'm still a little reticent to think that to, to be to conclude that it is the spirit realm or project or sends us physically in the spirit realm because that's what it feels like is happening of course it feels like you're shot out of your body and in an objective ex existing realm but if we can't get that bit of you know what i'm so that's a conundrum isn't it because if, if you don't get that but we do get it from just basic Solomonic evocation or regular fairy work that, you know, so that's, that's a, a limit to our knowledge. It's, I really, I'm excited about this. And I think you can guess why I'd be excited about this little vari variance in information. Cause I think it's one a question that we can answer and answer maybe relatively soon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the question that comes up for me with that is who is doing the, who is, who's doing the medicine, right? What is their preparation going in? What is their demonstrated ability to get information um, outside of that using other rituals? I mean, there's like a whole like cascade of qualifi qualifying um, questions that I would be, that, that I think would be really important to look at, right? To try and get the, to try and get that verifiable data. Yeah, I did my first major round of DMT work in 2020, obviously, in <laughs> COVID. Um, but during the next one, I, uh, the first step, I think, will be to see if I can answer that question for myself. Yeah. Because if I, can, if I can prove that to myself, then I'll know it's possible. And then the only question is, what would it require and to prove that in a clinical setting? Yeah, I mean, and the other thing is something can be said for what DMT is enacting in the body, right? Because that it 
as I understand it, it is at least in 5-MeO, it's directly interacting with the pineal gland, right? And so is there, and, and Martin Ball talks about the pineal gland as sort of like the mouth of God in the body or the seat of, of the divine consciousness in the body. And so- It's why they have a huge acorn in the Vatican. In the pine cone, right? The pine cone, yeah. Um, so, so the interesting thing about that is, is there something neurochemically that is happening in the pineal gland with that medicine because it's flooding it? Well, we 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 produce DMT endogenously, right, in that yeah, gland. But the yeah. DMT is just getting flooded then, and so is that taking off certain brain, higher brain functions that one might be utilizing and doing more Solomonic or magical uh, ritual to get information that one might not have access to be access to during the flooding of the DMT because of the way that it takes one into this sort of transcendent state. I don't know. It's just that, you know, it would be interesting to look at the neurochemistry and the way the brain is structured around and during a DMT experience to, to be part of how you answer that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you find it as interesting as I do. <laughs> uh, I look forward to uh, our collective human knowledge progressing more in that area. Yeah, be fun. For sure. It should be it should be really fun. So you haven't tried uh, regular NNDMT? I've been to Burning Man a few times, so I'm trying to. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I think if you ever try it out in like you know controlled set and settings that you'll be very pleased because it's like the realms are more colorful they're, they're more varietous they're almost they're infinitely varietous and yeah, 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 yeah. with actual ent entities rather yeah, than I, I mean it was I, more straight white light i mostly have worked with um psilocybin 5-meo and a little bit of um of mdma yeah and then i mean and then cannabis but you know that's that sort of goes without we're, we're, we're on the West Coast. That's just basically means you go outside and breathe the air sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, so yeah, here, 5-MEO DMT is legal in Canada. Always has been. It's a peyote. You can buy it over the counter. Mm. You know, it's fun, fun, fun place to be trapped, I guess. <laughs> if you're going to be not allowed to leave a country, it's the least they can do is give you legal peyote and DMT. Right, right. Yeah, well, we... <laughs> The, the decriminalized nature, which uh, we've been involved with various um, side groups to to um, to that to that movement here in the Bay Area, awesome. um, has has made some headway in certain cities. You know, like Oakland decriminalized. Yeah, they decriminalized mushrooms, didn't they, in Oakland? Yeah, because for mental health reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there when that happened. That was really big news. That was exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really cool that we're finally starting to re-explore this stuff. And it's just a, such a shame we've put it on the back burner for so long. And Yeah. You know, yeah. and just pushed all these pharmaceuticals that are nasty, nasty well, stuff. Well, I think some of the research that's been coming out of CIIS has definitely been helping that. You know, the psychedelic studies certificate program and whatnot, looking at MDMA and ketamine-assisted therapies, psychedelic-assisted therapies, you know, has definitely helped. Yeah, I struggled for years with PTSD and, and then a friend who, who also had way worse PTSD from being in like Canadian black ops and stuff. And he was like, the only thing that saved my life was like he microdosed Molly for two years and it just went away and it just went away and he's fine. And, and I tried it and it went away and never came back and fine. But before that, it was like constant hypervigilance, all the shit from, you know, I had a home, I had a thing that happened to me. So I was quite shook up and uh, didn't seem like it was ever going to end. And, yeah, I really am excited about these these medicines that actually help us becoming more common. Yeah, I mean, the microdosing uh, movement, whether it's the MDMA or the psilocybin, seems to be really, um, you know, the early results seem to be really compelling as to the efficacy for things like PTSD and, and, and different, you know, um, anxiety and stress. Yeah, and oddly, it might be drugs like magic mushrooms that help addiction the most <laughs> you know like how ironic <laughs> this the the problem is the cure mm -hmm. let's just switch off the crack and onto mushrooms and you might have a better chance than uh otherwise right yeah. so when it, when it comes to um spirit marriage there's a few more questions i definitely have about this 
how would you distinguish like if if you can have as many patron spirits can is there a downside to just gathering up patron spirits and spirit marriages or is the only downside to having you know adding more of those into your life the fact that it's harder to dedicate the amount of time you need to keep those relationships healthy yeah i mean i i would say you know as somebody who has practiced at various times polyamory um the downside is like it's a lot of bandwidth and energy to run you know um and you have to tend those relationships and you know uh the the upside with spiritual or spirit marriage polyamory is that it's not as much of a scheduling nightmare as human polyamory can be but um but you 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 do need to you know manage those relationships and you know uh caroline Kenner is married to a number of different spirits and you know she talks about how um her interest in you know she's got such a rich spirit um connection life and and has for most of her most of her life I mean since she was a small child she's been hearing and conversing with the spirits and she has four or five different spirit marriages which keeps her very busy and not as interested in, you know, mundane human stuff. So that can be kind of a, a, a downside, depending on what you need to do in your mundane human life. Um, but there is the, you know, uh, the individual practitioner, like Orion said that um, his marriage to Brie doesn't really leave much room for any other spirit marriage. He has a human spouse or a human uh, partner, but um, his, the, and, and that I think often it comes down to the nature and the cosmology of the entity being contacted. So in the example of Orion and Brie, this fairy marriage took him seven years to attune to and um, was very arduous and is kind of all encompassing. And that is, um, that's, that's noteworthy. And it's also not uncommon for the nature of that kind of primordial fairy being. Um, whereas with some of the Loa, um, <coughs> in the marriage Loa, when someone marries Erzuli Dantour, they also need to marry Erzuli Freida because there's this balancing that happens between the two of them. And so there are some deities where if you marry one, you marry the other and they're like a package deal. And, um, and so you kind of go into it in this kind of polyamorous uh, uh, sort of situation. Uh, interesting. I realize I've been covering up my patron this whole time. We should bring him into the scene. There we go. Sorry, buddy. All right. I, is that yeah. Ibis? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little Jehuti. Right. Oh, nice. Yeah. I uh, didn't have room for an altar for a while, and I finally made room in, in our, our little shack here. So I'm getting the, getting things going, you know, organizing. Next well, to that's, God. The other, that's the other consideration is, you know, in, in many of these traditions, you have a specific altar for your spirit spouse. And so if you've got more than one, you gotta have a lot of space for altars and, you know, that get tended, right, on a regular basis. Yeah. There's space considerations as well. Yeah, it's tough in a place where you don't even really have room to do sun salutations. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, that's what we get for living in Vancouver and Frisco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, you, you know, can we can we get a little bit into the sex stuff? Because I know people are going to rag on me if I don't touch on it. Um, but though I do want to point out that that people should go check out your YouTube. Uh, that's where you talked with Caroline, Caroline, the witch doctor. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. you've got a. a, a and I a have a YouTube. Your, I have a YouTube on there on spirit, spirit sex and, you know, ero eroticism with spirits as well. I did a chat about that last fall so they can watch that. I mean. It really comes back to what I was talking about earlier with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and this sort of like vitalism that arose in my body. Um, <clears throat> and also my training as a Shakta Tantric. So in the Shakta, in some of the Shakta practices, one is using the, the vitality, the, the Shakti, the um, uh, arousal energy, 
as part of a visualized practice with the deity to to foster the bond, to foster the communication, and to foster a kind of indwelling um, in the body or a rising in the body of that that god form, that deity form, um, and what I like to say is that um, the the intimacy, right? The intimacy of the bonded nature with with the with the spirit or with the deity often can take an erotic um, component because the vitalizing effect that these otherworldly beings often have on our nervous system registers right it registers as erotic um but it isn't necessarily it although it could be our intention meaning like i want to have this erotic encounter because that it feels really nice or it kind of opens me up it often isn't the intention of the the beloved the deity um and that is, again, in a no like, and trust, right? We're setting aside incubi, succubi, and those that the nature of those kind of relationships and focusing solely on spirit marriage. I vetted the spirit, they're asking to marry me, or I'm interested in wooing them. And we're having a, um, a committed, bonded, exploratory relationship around this, this level of commitment. Um, depending on who you talk to, um, the eroticism is sort of a byproduct, but not necessarily the goal of the relationship. So Orion says, you know, when he and Brie make love, it's not that that is their it's not like with a human couple where you're coming together to, to, to connect to each other and make each other feel good. It's more like she arises inside of him and his whole body goes into exaltation, not just his genitals. Like, and that's certainly been my experience. It's a whole body exaltation that feels more like a quickening or an activation. Caroline describes it as a healing or an empowerment that the eroticism is is very much a part of her relationship with her spirit spouses but that it is more um like quickening the cells of her body um activating her empowering her transmitting um more so than what we think of as more just um base baseline sex um so it's a little more of that mystical experience, right? That, yeah. that Teresa of Avila talked about, that John of the Cross talked about, that the Beguines talk about, where Meister Eckhart talked about it, where we're sort of suffused, right? Meister Eckhart, in fact, I think, I think this is his quote where he says, to make love with God is to like suffuse oneself with a sort of otherworldly intelligence and, and way of being, I'm paraphrasing. Of That's course. what it feels like. I mean, but yeah. it, it is a kind of suffusion and um, it's certainly prevalent in um, the, the tantric practices and you, um, depending on the tradition, you know, some people, it, they're a little more um, puritanical about it and, and, or they downplay it a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's absolutely there. And you know, if we set aside our judgments around sexuality and what's going on with sexuality and we just look at it as a kind of communion, then it is a very blessed and potent practice within the, the auspices of, of spirit marriage. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, the, that was for the first time I merged with the spirit. I was like an angel being the first time I astral traveled successfully. And it was very present being told me the same. We talked. I was like, can I try this out? And she was like, sure, absolutely. And when we merged through each other, it was like, out, it was incredible waves of ecstasy. Like the only comparison I would have to it, I was really, you know, early teens at the time I did it. I wouldn't have, I didn't have any means to compare that in the real world until I was like 30 the, for the first time trying ecstasy. And I was like, this is the first time I felt what I felt astrally you know out of my body which was crazy that 
those two comparisons were so equivalent because in one you're literally out of your body or if you're if you're a non-believer then you're just fantasizing lying in bed with your eyes closed right um how could that not be replicated by anything you've experienced including sex in real life until you like try something that hardcore like old i'm talking old school ecstasy not the not pure mdma i'm talking like the <laughs> the waves of crazy shit um it was never my cup of tea i can't handle the uh, come down at all um of the old school ecstasy stuff that was big before i was you know big in the 90s i was never into the rave stuff i was too busy doing spirituality right but yeah th but the climax point that was really interesting that you might find interesting is at the climax point what happened was it felt like my mother mind my awareness the eye vanished and i was their mind and that was the shocking, most shocking thing. At the climax, it was just momentary, but it was like I had the angel's mind in my own head and my, my brain was gone somewhere else. Maybe it was in theirs, obviously. And so that was, that was the craziest thing about that. Anyway, it was this moment where it was like our minds switched. Yeah, I mean, for me, that sense of enlivenment or arousal or ecstasis Quickly. was the, the quintessential indicator that I was in contact with my beloved, right? Um, because, and RJ, you know, um, RJ and Stan Groff talk about the importance of the somatic, like the visuals we can't really trust, the auditory we can't really trust, you because there can be a lot of fluctuation, but the somatic, how something feels to you is one of the most important discernment tools. And so in that 15 year journey of really trying to um, come to terms with the idea, identity of the, the beloved, it was that somatic response, whether he was showing up as an animal form or an energy form or a deity God form or a goddess form, it was that somatic response every time that let me know that that was the contact that that i was um, engaging with it's almost like so the feelings are are primary are important are, are almost like the, the 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 rudder by which you go through the waters of vision and sounds and stuff almost i was saying it's, it's you can almost say it's like saying we may see through a lens darkly but we feel just fine mm -hmm. <laughs> i like that <laughs> you know vision might not be so accurate but your feelings yeah i like that that's good um is is there any ever uh did you research did your research or experiences ever reveal possible problems that might arise from spirit marriages in the content when they enter into uh when you have a real relationship like any issues of people having spirit marriages that uh, uh, you know what are the problems that that might have caused for some people with in real with their yeah real you know um the 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 people that I'm I regret saying real relationships. I regret. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I really regret human. saying con yeah, that. human, human. The Thank human you. partnerships yeah. are impacted. I know some it listeners there were like, it, "What?" It really, it really depends on um, the individual and honestly on the spirit. So, for example, with um, the Shakta Tantric, who's married to the goddess Kali. Kali is known to be a consortless goddess. Um, she she doesn't share, um, and so uh, Kama. <laughs> so Kama isn't in a human relationship. She's she's tried to be in human relationships, but Kali is very all all encompassing, and her devotion. And she's a she's a guru. She's a teacher, and has a whole community that she serves, and it doesn't leave much space for her to have a human relationship. But um, as I mentioned, Orion has a human partner that um, he's engaged to. Caroline is married. Uh, the West African Shrine Keeper is married. Um, a number of them are married to human, human partners as well as their spirit spouses. What seems to be the most important thing is that this, the human respect the tradition that you're in if they're not a, an outright practitioner themselves so it's really helpful if the the human partner is a practitioner 
of the tradition that you're practicing or has a parallel practice of their own so that they understand the the requirements right that you're and the and the gesa or the the things that you're beholden to in being in that spirit marriage and aren't trying to you know compete for time and energy yeah i like it in the context of the, the gesa it's a good good irish fairy word um that's that's, that's interesting so yeah because i could see uh i could see it adding extra complexity to everyday relationships for sure unless uh, especially if one person's not though though relationships can always be a struggle when one person has an active spiritual life and practice and the other doesn't as we all know yeah. that's uh yeah. that's never that doesn't necessarily yeah can be problematic um what if people want to start a spirit marriage want to find a being to, to marry and they don't really aren't committed to a tradition and they just want to find a spirit that you know they want to open themselves up to Spirits and they don't necessarily have the inclination to go the traditional ceremonial magic route, or they don't have access to a, a tradition like such as you have so up and down the West Coast with people like R.J. Stewart and the, the, all the fairy traditions that you have there. And there's a very active slew of magical traditions on the West Coast of North America that people can easily access, but many people in the world aren't as lucky as us when it comes to that I'm, I'm pretty sure so what yeah. if, if someone's just sitting out there you know where they live away from all this wonderful new age and occult stuff that we have had at our fingertips what might they do i would they look for maybe a spirit of the land or if there's good practices or just what would you recommend yeah well first of all um i've sort of oriented my my practice, right? I have classes and groups that I run um, for just those folks. So oh, wow. I have a number of people that are students of mine um, that don't have a lineage that they sit within. They, um, a, a number of people are having relationships with beloved dead and beloved dead that don't necessarily have uh, provenance within like a spiritual tradition. Um, and so they're having to figure it out on their own. So that's sort of what I've oriented my, my practice around is for people that don't necessarily feel called into a particular tradition, or they maybe cross a few different pantheons and want a community and want um, teachings that will give them sort of um, an interdenominational, right, interdenominational approach to spirit marriage. So that's you know, I, I talk about it in my book and I have, you know, a spirit marriage 101 self-study course and a, a group program that I run that people can can learn more about how to develop themselves. And what I like to say is that, you know, you might not have a spirit that is ringing your doorbell saying, I want to marry you, but we all have a divine self, right? We all have our angel, our holy, you know, the holy guardian angel, the the Matet, the Ishtadevi, whatever you're language you want to use for the divine self that we can develop a deeply loving devotional bonded relationship with and i encourage everybody to start there right you know it's the the edict of know thyself right and who is who are you here to flavor you know to season the world with what is your ray what is your expression what is your um flavor of the divine that you're here to to express and like with the angel, um, it could be a myriad, right, of names or things or or constellations, right? It doesn't have to just be, oh, I'm here to express Aphrodite or I'm here to express Isis or I'm here to express, you know, Sophia it, or whatever. Um, it, it could be as unique as your own fingerprint. And so really learning and stepping into that quest, right? That journey, that great work of uncovering that for yourself, whether you want to do that in a, through a ceremonial lens or through a, a you know, a inter, interdenominational kind of lens, which is my work or one of these other paths that help you discern that. Any, any um, word on people marrying demons or unclean spirits? Well, 
I mean, we go off on the whole demon and what are, you know, that whole language of beings of the un underworld, right? Like uh, that's a, that's way more for us to unpack, maybe another conversation another day. But yeah. <laughs> as far as unclean spirits, I would, I would question why you would want to bond with an unclean spirit. You know, what's the purpose of that? What's the kind of work that you're taking on in doing that? Again, I encourage people to step into healthy relationships with spirits that you know, like, and trust. Yeah. Um, is it a spirit that is a trickster? Is it a spirit that maybe is a fiercer spirit? Like that's a different kettle of fish than maybe a spirit that is um, a malicious spirit that's here to do harm, right? But yeah, I can't even, see being smart to marry one of those because- It's not a good idea. <laughs> but if you really were, are a left-hand path practitioner, and you, you really believe in causing suffering to yourself, that might be, I guess, the way to do it. You know, who knows? I don't personally recommend it, but I'm sure there are people out there that do it. And, you know, and then there's always the cultural context of harm to who, you know, like, as we understand, you know, that there are certain spirits that are protector, more protector beings, and that, um that can cause harm in situations of injustice you know um but again like looking from a that wider perspective of you know what is um what is what is justified magic right what is justified left-handed magic when when they're we're talking about oppression when we're talking about marginalization um, so there might be a badass spirit that, you know, that you, that you step into relationship with. I mean, certainly Kali is fierce, right? And some of the yogini um, are, are fierce, but they also um, have this loving mother, you know, aspect to them as well. So, um, and, and like some of the tantric deities, there's, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of different versions, right? There's not just Kali, there's Aja Kali and Dakshin Kali and Shmashana Kali and like all of these different permutations, right? So, um, and some which are like a Chanmunda is way more fierce, right? Than like, uh, uh, you know, another form of, um, of a Kali, like a Bhagalamukhi or Bhagalamukhi is not Kali, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was worth touching on that, even though it's yeah, also not my cup of tea. The, the demons, I wouldn't want to marry a demon, but yeah, they are useful, I guess, occasionally. Um, good for getting things done, but. Well, and, you know, I had a, one of my tantra teachers, this is a Shaivite, um, told me once that demons are just angels whose names have been forgotten. Yeah, it's a nice. And that, you know, as a fairy worker also, I'm very, you know, attuned to the fact that the fairy people for uh, a, a large portion of the Christian overlay um, have been demonized, right? So even talking about what is a demon is oh, a, yeah. a yeah. worthy inquiry. Yes, yeah. When I say it, definitely, I usually mean like the hardcore demon demon ones. Um, which the there are, because there are ones, there are ones. Yeah, there are those ones. That's usually what I mean. Yeah, I'm not talking about just general chthonic stuff and things that right. are misunderstood, right. of course. Um, right. But I don't know, it's interesting. I, I, I have more questions now. Uh, <laughs> sit there and simmer in my brain. Um, yeah. Because the spirit marriage thing is very fascinating and I'm delighted you've brought it sort of into the conversation and to the fore with this book. And I think, yeah, I think it's, you're going to see a lot of people uh, very keen to go and get it. And honestly, I think, you know, people go get it and drop a review on Amazon because, you know, you got to counterbalance the wankers out there who just want to drop one star hate occasionally. So, yeah, <laughs> minions, monkeys fly and, uh, <laughs> and uh, do your thing. You know what to do. Yeah. So that's that's really, really exciting. I, I hope that more people start investigating into this field that you sort of seems like you've opened up uh, to the general public all of a sudden, so. 
that's yeah. been my intention is to just open the roads a little bit and get the conversation going. I mean, you know, as a religious studies scholar um, and someone who is in a ministerial role, it is really about dialogue and conversation and, um, and really saying that, you know, this, look, this is a practice that's been with us since the beginning of civilization, written civilization. I mean, the first accounts show up in the um, Sumerian sacred marriage and the ancient Mesopotamian texts, you know, and I venture to guess much has, has been a practice, like I said, since the beginning of, you know, uh, human civilization, human consciousness, really. Um, yeah. And and it's transcultural. Like, I don't think at this point that there is a culture that this has not touched and hasn't wow. been in practice in some way, shape or form. I mean, I just was reading about the fox cults um, in China, right? And the, the merging of the, the Taoist practitioners with the fox deities and the fox um, fairy beings. And there's like a whole lineage of, of fox magic practitioners that claim their descent from these extraordinary- really? The, the the Hawaiian Kahuna practices uh, or the, the the practices of the um, the Polynesian um, Hula Heiau um, and I'm probably not getting that term right but I, I just learned about like how they claim descent from the goddess Pele and her marriage with these particular um, these particular teaching schools there um, it's just it's it's rampant throughout throughout human culture and um and yet they don't teach us this in high school except we don't learn it we don't even learn it in seminary other than no. you know, like anecdotals so yeah. I, think it's really, I think it's a really worthy inquiry and and asking the questions you know i i end the book with probably more questions than answers right and i in my own journey with this with more questions than answers like i don't have hard fast um facts or summaries i have like here's the th trends here's the things that we see and it's really for us to continue to grow and deepen and evolve with this material um because that i think the application um and somebody will and and i say this in the book like you may read all this and come to different conclusions than i came to fantastic great that's called evolution of knowledge. And that's called, you know, that's called bringing your own critical thinking to the material. And, um, and I really encourage that, right? Wow, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, shall we, shall we call wrap it? it? Shall yeah. we wrap it up? I mean, that was one, that was wonderful. And, uh, and uh, I do, yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll talk again, um, yeah. That would be great. Uh, love to do a fairy round table, get some of the fairy folk on there. And um, yeah, I'd love to uh, talk more once I've gotten to uh, really, really uh, read every page of your book, which I fully intend to do. And I'm going to make a whole review on it because this is very, very exciting. As soon as I found out that I thought originally, I didn't know what your, I didn't, I misunderstood what your book was about when, uh, when you first released it. And it wasn't until you asked to do the podcast that I, of course, then looked into it. And I was like, oh, Okay, I thought you were sort of like taking a psychologist's approach originally because I didn't know anything. I was assuming on just marriage, on you know, and bringing it, making it more spiritual. Then I was like, oh no, she's talking about marriage spirits. I'm like, this is very exciting. Can't wait. So yeah, it was very exciting. And you look, you look well recovered from the from the Rona. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we both I'm, had it the I'm, last two, just leading up to this. So we both. Uh, <laughs> kept yeah, we keep going through it. Uh, yeah, I'm like ninety nine percent there. Um, yeah, and I will say that, you know, to the end of like me constantly continuing this research project and collecting stories, um, there's a website that I've created for the book called spiritmarriage.com. And you can go and share if you have accounts um, from other cultures or traditions that aren't mentioned in the book, because there's plenty, um, or your own story that you want to share, please I feel free to, you know, go to the website and um, and submit that to me because I'm still collecting, collecting, collecting. And Wonderful. if you're interested in, you know, any of the courses um, or materials that I teach, you can go to drmeganrose.com and learn more there. Yeah, people go to those sites, spiritmarriage.com. 
and drmeganrose.com and uh yes sir yeah, part participate participate in this very exciting uh field it's uh yeah it's been a treat and uh i hope we get to to meet face to face again someday and uh you know when the when we when we're allowed to leave our, uh, our the ghetto of canada <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a it's been a journey hey yeah um there was something i was gonna say ask um oh um are you uh, already working on the next book i don't mean to be cheeky but I, I I know writers pretty well, and I've learned that generally it's not what you'd expect. Um, you know, I, not the next book, I have a research project, um, oh. a, a, a research project that I'm, that I am putting together a proposal for an IRB um, uh, certified project that will look at spiritual intimacy. So, What's IRB? Uh, uh, internal review board, meaning okay. sort of like a, a more of a clinical study of looking at spirit to intimacy. So humans who have intimate relationships with other worldly beings. So uh -huh. spirit marriage is like a very specific, like here's the bonded, committed relationship. You've gone through a marriage sort of ritual. Spiritual intimacy is more of this area that we were just talking about around erotic and intimate encounters with other worldly beings. And I have a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who's a clinical sexologist and we're putting together a study that wow. uh, will will look at this and hopefully the the goal with that is to bring more awareness to the um both the sexological and the psychological circles of this as a you know legitimate spiritual sexual orientation and practice um because right now it's sort of in this ghetto of like weirdness and um i'm all, all for the weird but i want you know um practitioners you know counselors therapists whatever to understand that you know when someone is talking about this sort of an exchange this sort of uh phenomenological experience that it is a bona fide a bona fide relationship a bona fide experience so that's sort of what's next on the horizon. Fascinating. I love you. You're just plowing forward. See, it's like, it's like I said, it's never what you expect. I thought you would just have, I thought you would have plowed into the next book already because it's such a exciting and edgy topic. Uh, but no, you're doing a clinical study. So that is definitely, I'm glad I asked. That's what we're planning. And, you know, the yeah. next book, I, I'm still sitting with, well, like, what would the next book be? Like, what's the next phase of this? What are the questions? And I'm, I'm still very glad. curious. Yeah, I'm very well, so I'm, that's what probably why you're doing a research thing to help find out for yourself well because yeah. because a lot of it is like what is the question right what is the question that folks have and that needs to be answered and i had the question of what is spirit marriage and i'm still waiting for what that next question is is for the follow-up to this and it might be around the divine self technologies it might be around spiritual intimacy it might be something else so we will see well dr megan rose Thank you for coming on Magic Without yeah. Fears, the Hermetic Podcast, and this has been just such a treat. And I, I miss, I uh, miss California and all my friends in California very much. And I hope you guys, uh, um, what shall I say? Maybe I'll say nothing. <laughs> I hope you guys make it through this like the rest of the world. Yeah, we do too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's you know, been it's an honor to be here today. Cheers. Um, yeah, people go, go, uh, go get that book and uh, leave a good review on Goodreads as well as Amazon. This is something that's becoming increasingly important to authors. Um, a lot of us have been noticing. Um, so, you know, if our fans can help us out here and there, we appreciate it. Yeah, help a girl out. Yeah, and you have a lovely day. It's the same time for you as it is for me. So uh, what, what's your dinner plans? Anything exciting? Um, refilling my canteen. I won ran out of water, like oh, three quarters beautiful. of the wave, wave um, through, and I'm like so parched at this. You know, I'm still dried out from the whole for, from the whole Rona. So I'm gonna uh, hydrate and um, probably watch a movie and chill because you know I'm still in the tail end of the the you know muddiness of the virus in my system. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm on going. This is the sec my second month on medication. I can't stand medication pills, like you know, antibiotics, all that stuff. It's just, yeah. it's like I'll be going through my day and all of a sudden fatigue, exhaustion, nausea. Anyway, fun times. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> yes, 
we are uh, we are having a human experience. We and, uh, are. Deal with it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for being here. This was awesome. Um, I hope you keep the idea of a fairy round table in the back of your back burner. Um, you know. um, maybe if you have any people worth having on it to run it by them if they're interested. Um, I'm, I'll run it by Storm because he was really fun to talk to and I could talk to him all day. And, and yeah, there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff going on the fairy traditions, which of course is very close to my heart. As you know, from my Yates lecture, was that fun? Did you like that? Was it good? Oh, I loved it. It was fantastic. It was like a fever yeah. dream now. Like it seemed like I, I, I was expecting a tiny room as everyone knows, and it was a massive hall filled with people. And I was very flattered. And it was great to meet you and so many others. Oh my God. Yeah, I really can't wait to get back lecture. to lovely lecture. Thank got a lot out of it yeah it was an hour and a half i really like that you know often at academic conferences they only give us a half hour right um yeah at most so it, it was like i don't know you can barely get much done in half an hour except you can make you know premise conclusion and then you argue with people while they slowly walk out when they disagree with you <laughs> like yeah, that, exactly. that's exactly. what i was expecting at yeah. PantheaCon was that style of lecture like 12 people half of whom leave when I make my main point because they don't like it, <laughs> you know, that academic style. But it was this wonderful, delightful experience for anyone who's considering doing conferences like PantheoCon. And I don't know how many there are out there in North America. I know there's basically none here in Canada. Um, or every time we try and do them, they get canceled because white supremacists keep showing up and stuff like that, which is, you know. There are more regional conferences that have been popping up here, not as big of as an overarching PantheoCon type. Um, but like, I think there's Mystic South and um, uh, a few different more like, you know, um, regional, regional style conferences that are happening. So they're there, but you know, with the, with the COVID restrictions and stuff, it's just been a lot of online. I, I'm looking at doing a spirit marriage uh, conference online, um, kind of like the idea of a round table, but with people from different spirit marriage traditions coming in and talking and stuff, hopefully this fall. So that might also be something that is on the horizon uh, for right. me, is yeah. putting, putting together a conference. So. Keep your eyes out for that, people. Yeah. yeah. Join my yeah. email list and you'll get all yeah. the all the juicy, juicy announcements when they come out. Yeah. All right. Well, have a lovely evening in beautiful San Francisco. Thank you. It is it is nice and sunny here today. It is it's a gorgeous day here too. I'm gonna go. I live two blocks from the beach, so I'm right on right on the water and gonna go for a walk there now and yeah. talk go to some, some spirits. Air. Yeah, go see. Uh, huh? I what? said, go get some air. Yes, it's time. Um, ah, the last few years has been easy to forget to walk. So off we go. Take care. Take Much care. Love. Thank Much you. love. See ya. Much love to you too. Bye. Bye.